Welcome everyone to uh, another one of the Scottish uh, regional uh, lecture series of the Royal Photographic Society. I'm James Ross, I'm the regional organiser for a few more days yet of the Scottish Regional Hub. And today it is really my great pleasure to introduce David Stewart, who has been uh, promised as a speaker for a number of events over the last few years, but because of things beginning with C, uh, things have been delayed. Um, but David Stewart is a professional photographer, filmmaker, widely published and exhibited. Um, and I would encourage you to look at his website for more examples of his work that he might or might not show us here. His work has also been extensively recognised from a BAFTA nomination to various photographic awards uh, relevant to the RPS. There are two, one is the um, Taylor Wessing Portrait Award and the other the Editorial Advertising and Fashion um, Photography Award. And really the quality of his work speaks for itself. So we will be seeing things on Zoom, um, but, but really go and look at the website to see the, the quality in case you don't get across on the actual Zoom, um, the, the, the screen that's, that, that's coming across. On. So it gives me with great pleasure to introduce uh, David Stewart and I look forward to listening to you. David, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having us in tonight. I hope um, everybody's all right out there. Um, I think we'll start at the beginning really, which is um, I sort of became a photographer. I left college in 1981 um, and was an assistant for a couple of years to a couple of still life photographers in London. Uh, and these are the times when we we're all working on large format cameras um, on transparent film. So I actually started as, um, as a still life um, photographer, um, pretty much just doing very much object based still life work, which which is what I learned when I worked for the guys assisting. Uh, so what you did was you went in at the weekends, built a portfolio of your own work, and hopefully with a view to going out looking for your own work after you'd got a big enough portfolio or you felt like you were ready to do that. So I've always had this sort of style of very much setting things up. And this is what I'm really showing this because it sort of leads into the portrait work further down the line. So my sort of early work was very much tabletop still life. And um, sorry, I'm losing the arrows there. Just odd objects on backgrounds, simple stuff all shot on large format, usually on 10, 10 by eight transparency film. So this is round about the 19, mid eighties to nineties, uh, fairly mundane subjects. And of course what happens is this sort of brings you work in as you go around, you take your portfolio around, design agencies, advertising agencies, and then eventually maybe get an agent and, um, you sort of pick up work very much like what, you're, what is in your portfolio, which is this sort of odd object stuff. Um, often the work became a little bit more conceptual. So people would come to you with an idea and expect you to shoot it in a particular style of your own work. So they're looking as a, for an, from an aesthetic really. But as things progress, you became, I became more conceptual because a lot of the ideas were given to me had these sort of background ideas. So for example, this was for, a Sony CD player, which was in your car boot. Um, and so they come up with a sort of concept where it reflects that idea of a traffic jam, and you could, but you could still change the CD within the car. So I, I sort of learned about these unusual advertising concepts and I, that's brought back into my personal work a bit. Uh, this particular shot was for anti-smoking and uh, the copy line on that was cigarette ends. And I'm obviously working with set builders and model makers. Um, this particular model is 14 foot across with the real person in wrapped in a tablecloth in that particular ashtray. So there was, you know, there's no computer work at this point. And this is probably 1989, 1990. Um, so everything was done in camera and built and that's, Sort of stuck with me throughout my whole career because you can't really shake it even when digital come along I found it hard to shake this sort of process and I went from doing single objects and just basically replaced them with people and it was as simple as that really I, I sort of tired a little bit of doing still life and 
thought, how could you move it on? And it was really a case of moving it on by changing the content of the work. Uh, and as you can see from that last one, it's just a pure replacement of a man for a bottle. Um, same lighting, just a bigger set. I wasn't really thinking about portraiture at this point. It's just more about shape and graphics and you know, slightly sort of surreal abstract work and using people more like props, as we would probably call it. Uh, similarly with this, um, building more elements for people to stand on. This is actually shot outside against a painted screen. And that's actually shot in daylight outside. Uh, another one, which is a still, I did a little short film at this point, about 1995, called Cabbage. And this is one of the characters from Cabbage. And this is the first time I was really doing portraits. So it's portrait of a character from a film. Similarly with that, just making this sort of slightly surreal observations. The film was about cabbages and a man going farming for cabbages, but I sort of equated it to this fisherman idea. So it's fairly random stuff. This was a poster for the film. Again, this is shot outside, soil put down on the ground and a painted screen and a model made staircase. And what you're seeing here is the real thing. I mean, there's no real retouching on this. It's actually daylight shot pretty much on a 10-8 camera straight on with no interference from any digital, apart from these, there's obviously we're scanning, scanning the film, but there's no retouching as such. And that moved us more on to doing more portrait work. I sort of became more interested in people really and the stories that um, they had to tell. This started as a project called Fogies and it was a sort of reaction against all the pictures at this particular moment were black and white, miserable pictures of old people. And I sort of took it completely the opposite way, made it very much like a kitsch, bright world where these old people were having fun. It was like almost like growing old disgracefully rather than these sort of sad people, which most pictures were about. I mean, there were like reportage pictures of old people were always very sort of miserable at this point. Um, talking about in the mid nineties here, that was called Desi's first date. These two ladies were twins who worked at John Lewis for I think 40 odd years. And it's still bringing this like conceptual idea in that particular picture is called Marigold. And because it was such a fun kitsch project, we had quite a lot of fun with the titles of the, of the, um, the shots as well. And it sort of became part of it. It's like a bit like puns on photography and sort of visual jokes really. Um, you know, these two old ladies, Women's Institute sort of style floor and chairs with their sort of wartime rations almost there. Uh, that was actually called luncheon meat. It's a photo booth situation with the old ladies again, sort of playing the opposite gag really, which is people be behaving sort of badly even though they're older. This is tea time with Beryl. And as you, as you probably can see that these are still sort of carrying through from that still life approach where the camera is very much set up and you're sort of building within the frame, either the props, but obviously at this point now we're starting to think about casting people in these situations. So this is a totally personal project where you've concepted the ideas um, and thought about everything as you would with a commercial job, but it's bringing it into a personal project. So you're using all the skills that I've learned from doing these commercial jobs, but then bringing it back to my personal work. The whole project is very much um, a sort of bright colored kitsch world. That's called retiring. That one's Lou at 85. That's a shot on a roll film on 120 out of the back of a truck. Um, that one's six feet under. I don't know if you would call these portraits, but they're people 
that I'm almost using as props and the sort of stories that you might witness really. I mean, it's sort of pushing the boundaries of reality a little bit with this particular project, but it's something you could imagine happening in this country. It's got a very sort of British sense of humor about it. Um, that one's Charles Between the Sticks. That one woman was actually called June and that's, that's called June in February. Uh, and again, that's not um, snow, that's the salt stuff that they used in films and laid on a, somebody's back lawn and shot in daylight. So it's fairly simple sort of setups. It's just controlling the props and the people within the frame. And through this project, I think the work changed a little bit. So it became more from the sort of studio, static studio thing to a bit more reality of ideas. So, you know, just replacing hitchhikers with old men. Um, and it's just that comedy element and that sense of humor bringing it into it. That's actually it was called hippie replacement. And this one was called Game Boys. And this sort of set of work really hit home with a lot of commissioners, actually, because it's very easy to put things onto this, because at that particular time, a lot of advertising had a sense of humour, and people were quite interested in that idea of entertaining people through advertising. So you would um, come up with an idea that was sort of entertaining and had a payoff or had a punchline. And so this suited it perfectly. So this is about round about the late 90s. I think this book was actually, there was an exhibition um, which some copyrights came up with that line. And a book which was like 2001. So I never, when I started the project, was there an intention of doing a book, but I think it became apparent that it was worth just cataloging this set of work down in time almost and that sort of set of a bit of a template for everything else I've done ever since it's almost like you do the project and produce a book and an exhibition and that puts a marker down and what I found is that allows you to move on from that each time it's almost like full stop so you don't go backwards any at any point and you use what you've done to move further forward so this, this obviously this generated quite a lot of commercial work, um, but very what happens with advertising is they just basically take your personal work and use it in a slightly sort of diluted way. It's almost like they um, they sort of make you compromise slightly. So, for example, this picture was for a fennel flavored toothpaste. I think this was for a software company. This was for Malvern Water, and the copy line was not quite Middle England. As was this one, not quite Middle England. That one was for Olympus. And this one was for N Power. I think the copy line on that was there are some things in life you can't choose. So you can see at that point how advertising was pushing a few boundaries and taking a few risks. That one was for preparing for your future. And that one was for an energy drink called um, Carbro Force, I think it was called for France. I mean, I was getting work from European countries as well because they sort of loved that British sensibility. And so they'd use you to get that into their advertising. And that led on to another project called Thrice Removed, which again, as I say, taking from, feeding back from the projects into the commercial work, and then the commercial work back into the projects. Obviously, I'd been through this sort of spell of bright colours, kitsch, almost jokey puns. And so with this set, I tried to sort of go away from that. And uh, I've been looking at sort of people's work, other people's work around it. I came across um, a guy called um, Joel Sternfeld, who's an American landscape portrait photographer. I really uh, was taken with his work. I'd never come across it till about this, this point, which was probably around about the mid-2000s. And it was just much more 
pared back and stripped back. I mean, this is the first picture in this series, which follows on perfectly from the fogies because it's one of the guys from the grave picture, but then it's taken in a much more sort of subtle way, but still using that graphic background and shape. But as again, as this project progressed, it became more about uh, sort of observations I'd seen around. I'd sort of got a book of things I've witnessed and noticed and um, there's still sort of humour in these pictures, but much more turned down from obviously from the fogies pictures. Um, this is my three children who I noticed all used to dress the same or they had the hand-me-downs. And you know, this is at the point where we're starting to see this globalization thing occurring where everybody's wearing brands, <clears throat> everybody looks the same. And obviously I'm introducing that sheep idea into that particular concept. Uh, one of the kids was constantly gaming and I sort of thought that was a thing that was new and these game war games everywhere all over the the big gaming industry, um, shooting games. And this is my father who um, had a he had an age related um, macular degeneration so he could he couldn't really see he always used to say he was he could see only like misty surrounding shapes but I thought it was interesting that he was in his greenhouse which is always steamed up and his glasses were steamed up and you know these por these portraits be were always entered for the Taylor West thing actually through the years some of the fogies were um, and their sort of success over the years of getting them in to the Taylor West thing always an interesting thing to go and see your picture in a gallery and it almost removed it from your become your own context and you could see it differently and I think that was something that fed back very much back into the, the work having sort of taken it away from being obsessed with it and then going three months later to a gallery and seeing it for the first time almost changed what you felt about it and also what other people thought about it actually so introducing it to a public pl place where people have very different opinions to what you thought it was about there's a family called the Thomas family. And two sisters. And this is more like the Sternfeld thing I was talking about where he was using a lot of landscapes and portraiture. Again, I'm still shooting on a large format camera here, but on um, 400 negatives. So, there's a much more washed out look to a lot of these compared to the fogies, which were all shot on color transparency. So the film had a part to play as well in that it, it took back that intensity of color transparency and made it more real. I mean, I know these are still very staged pictures, but you know, this picture, for example, came about because I had actually witnessed um, a transit van on the motorway services. And I think about, six or eight nuns got out the back of it and I'd always remembered it and written it down and um, knew this location the Ribblehead viaduct and just thought it was an unusual combination of these nuns and this this viaduct it's like some sort of father Ted um, thing going on there like deforestation and really that's more about aging I always thought the guy's bald head was very much like the tree stumps. This guy, steamy hair guy, you know, it's um, a case of marrying two things together that you think make it inter an interesting portrait. I mean, the, you know, this is a pretty much straightforward portrait, but the steam just adds that extra little thing into it. The two boys with the cigarettes behind the bike sheds. And again, I thought they looked like cigarettes. And this pictures of my daughter who was 14 uh, at the time and um, she was very much into the sort of emo scene and obviously teenagers as they are being fairly uh, rebellious and uh, not really listening to anything you say, but I always thought it was really funny that they were always very miserable with you, with your parents. 
Um, and consequently, that's the joke I played with the fish. But that was her T-shirt. Uh, this was shortlisted for the Taylor Westing. I think it was called the Schweppes Portrait Prize at the particular time, but it was shortlisted and it came fourth. And this is five girls, which um, the same five girls I, I took the picture of seven years later did win the Taylor Whisting, which I'll show you in a minute. But this was taken when they were just about to do their GCSE. So we're just pre-smartphones here where you can see on the table, they were still all texting and still all communicating with each other. But they hadn't quite got to that smartphone thing. And, and it just brings in, starts to bring in a lot of these teenager things, which I cover in a later project, which is you know, phones, food, fashion, hair. And almost at this point, starting to notice this sort of, uh, the way they don't talk to, they're not really talking to each other and they communicate totally through their phones. I always remember they used to sort of text each other and hold their phone really close to their faces because they didn't want you to see what they were talking about. And it just sort of, I think I'd noticed about her and her, my daughter, which is the second one from the right, and her friends and how they had this united by hair thing going on. And now they all almost look the same, but they all thought they were different. Now this led back into more work, but this time I seem to be getting jobs which involved <laughs> the most weird people. Um, this was actually for the French railways and was telling people not to hitchhike, as was this one. So you can see how the fogies work generated much more bright colored kitsch work, where this project, again, has generated work which is similar to the project. I mean, the thing about the advertising industry is they always want something new. So if they think you not, they'll, they'll always say, oh, he does that thing with the color, doesn't he? So you have to almost prove that that's not what you do anymore to get more work. So to continue career as a commercial photographer, you just have to constantly move your portfolio around and constantly change so as people can see that that you can do other things uh i mean that's fine because that you know that's what i wanted to do personally personal project wise anyway so um it's not a problem for me to be doing new stuff all the time it's just whether it's commercial enough i mean i think this is way less commercial than the fogies work but it still did generate bits of work this is for channel four from magana show This was for an online poker called um, Poker Live. And they, that, the copy line on that was become the king of bluff. More weird people. I was the guy who got all the jobs with the weirdos at this point. But these are pretty much true portraits of characters. Um, I mean, I know they're invented because they're invented for the purpose of advertising, but, you know, all the references are brought from real life and working with casting and styling, who obviously are sourcing things that everybody's got reference points about people's clothes and people's bathrooms. So we're bringing all that together to produce these portraits, which, you know, it could easily be a real documentary portrait, it's just that it's been constructed for a reason. Same with that one, these three pictures were for Doritos. And that brought me on to an, another project called Teenage Preoccupation. Um, so this really led from the fact that that five girls picture in the previous project, Thrice Removed, it was such a good reaction to that work. And I, at this point, I had um, three children who were all teens and there was plenty of observation of what they were doing for me to sort of construct a set of ideas which I could then turn back into a project. So at this point we are at the where the internet is really, I mean the internet's been around for a while at this point but smartphones have really taken off at this point so people are living in a digital world now. Um, you know it's my commentary on almost how how would you get on the ladder you know it's my opinion at that point was i felt that there was 
no future for these kids actually and uh, you know consequently that's my play off that with a rusty ladder and a very short ladder because it just felt like they didn't and maybe still don't actually have a lot of opportunity back onto the fashion thing again the global fashions and the sportswear and again playing off things like the lines and the tracks and the background it's just trying to introduce into the portrait just other things that link, that just hold your attention for that extra moment that helps you to sort of move into the picture and try and explore it more. I sort of find that I can't really do something that's just very straightforward. It almost has to be something that there's hidden little stories going on so it will keep your attention a little bit longer. Now these two guys are 14 and 15 year old and this is obviously in London in Shoreditch and this is how they saw themselves as being the cool guys. I was always really funny that he looks like he stood on a trapdoor. You know ripped jeans, I'm not quite sure you know <laughs> again playing off the rips, the, the gates, um, the laces, everything to do with those little ideas of lines and gates and grills and stripes. Fast food. The addiction to the internet. And this is my sort of take on that, almost like being fed, drip fed. Um, and obviously a little rotten apple on the table there, which was thrown in as a little uh, dig at, at apple. But just this almost reliance becoming on screens, which this is, uh, the book was published in 2013. So this is round about 2012, these pictures were taken. Recurring theme, like the guns one from the thrice remove with the camouflage. Teenagers obviously obsessed with shooting games in their bedrooms on their own. You only live once. And then, you know, what's wrong with real instruments? <laughs> but um, they seem to like playing the games. Um, I and mean, it just would be more interesting to pick up a real guitar, wouldn't it? But that's obviously me looking at this generation. That's called Teens in Waiting Room with Heads Up. And um, that was organised through my daughter who was on a foundation course. And one after one on Saturday afternoon, I got her to gather together. I think there's 30 people in there actually, um, gather together to sort of get them all to come around my studio and uh, do this picture. And then we're all fed beer and pizza. Um, so that's basically her foundation year. And the same picture with the heads down. And onto the festival idea of the mud. And the prom, prom picture, so it's a leavers ball. Um, still goes on in a lot of the schools where they all dress up that evening. And the fashions. Interesting that they all feel very like they're individual, but they all look the same. And then this was, um, situation in the halls of residence where my daughter was where once a month they all had their hair cut by this girl and they've all had the similar haircuts uh, but they did this once a month it's almost like a ritualistic thing so I called I think it was called the shepherdess at the bin bag salon because they used to put a bin bag on the floor to collect all the hair dropped in, dropped in. 
And that's the second five girls picture, which was seven years on. So this is the, the point where they um, they were all just leaving university, actually. So it's the same five girls, seven years on from doing their GCSEs. So they'd all be around about 21 at that point. Uh, teenage preoccupation. There again, there was a a book and posters and a little exhibition. Uh, again, this again leads on to more work. Really, it's uh, this time because that project is possibly more theatrical, or I don't know, you call it more serious. I sort of tended to get a bit of theatre work, which was more to do with concepts coming straight from the actual plays and then me just reconstructing them in the studio. So these, these three pictures were for the Almeida in London for a Greek series. This is the catastrophe, catastrophe for Channel 4 and Romantics Anonymous at the Globe Theatre. It's a recent TV commission for a Sky series called Wolf. And that was Intelligence for Sky and Breeders for Sky. So the thing about these jobs is they're already pretty much set what you're gonna shoot because you're reconstructing possibly a scene from the drama. But the story's already there for you. So you just brought in to actually make that look good in a way. Um, but usually the story is quite interesting. So it makes it a bit better than advertising in a way, which these days has become almost like a brand global thing with no concept. So these things, the stories are quite interesting because the characters are all developed already. Um, so you, you get into shoot people who can obviously act and that sort of helps you to understand quite a lot about expressions and how people perform. And a lot of these, these um, characters in these theatre pictures, they know who they are. They won't, if you ask them to do something that's not in the character, they won't do it. They'll stick to the script. I mean, they know they've worked on that character. They know what expression they would do. So to get them to sort of smile or do something ridiculous, it's never going to happen because they'll just turn around to you and say, well, he, he wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that. So you've got quite a good boundaries on it, really, because, you know, they're proper actors and they're trying to make sure they don't look stupid. So you, you tend to get quite nice pictures from it. Um, the George, St. George at the National Theatre. And that's a one called Mosquitoes at the National Theatre. Again, the one translations. And Rutherford and Son. And you know, you can say these are all character portraits. Um, not much documentary about them, but you know, you are recording a, a live performance really, and a, a poster for a live performance, which Usually it's quite a historical thing. I mean, the National Theatre, the posters look very good. And they're around everywhere. And there's a whole sort of series of books about posters through the years. So you are almost documenting something that sticks in time. So that led on to um, my next project, which is called Paid Content. Um, so with a sort of slight almost disillusionment of the advertising industry, which has become global, um, digital, is weighed down with hundreds of people for some reason. I mean, going back to the original pictures, original commissions, one per, what would happen was you'd get a faxed layout, which was a line drawing. You'd interpret that and speak to an art director, one, just one person you'd speak to, and they would come on the shoot. And over the years, through the two, early 2000s, up to, right up to now, or up to the pandemic anyway, the amount of people on shoots increased. All these people turning up on shoot, commission shoots, who you don't really know what they do, but they all seem to have an opinion. And I sort of witnessed this really and decided that this would be quite a good 
good projects turn back on them. So I set off on this idea of photographing my life really. So going to a meeting, the reception desk at the agency, getting in the lift with the people that work at the advertising agency, who've all got their purchases from the global high street outlets of which they're all going back to their offices to advertise those outlets. So like this sort of vicious circle of people buying stuff and selling it back to themselves. And the wrong people in charge of the ideas, fruity, cheesy, smooth and bland. So these sort of think tanks and groups that come up with concepts and ideas, not the creative people. The shift in the advertising agencies has gone from possibly being 50-50 to 25% creative and the rest managers. There was meetings where everybody's afraid to say the wrong thing talking about these ridiculous words they come up with such as synergy and creative juice and I thought this was quite interesting obviously I've made it about Listerine because they can't really they can't really tell the truth these people they're just there sort of having to join in to sort of justify their positions The smoking area outside the agency. But then meanwhile, the kids who are all working there are all crammed in a room with headphones on trying to come up with the concepts. Not, not paid particularly well, never really given any choice to go out and shoot so have any fun anywhere, just constantly churning out work, which the majority of it doesn't really ever see the light of day. It's just purely so they can present to clients to make themselves look good. And then they get the perks of the old pizza. And all this came from talking to people in advertising and we're witnessing the change really and how it had become this corporate world. I mean, it was like, if you think about Mad Men from the 60s and then bring it forward to this point and how it's completely not about the work anymore and how they treat the people actually as well so you know all these kids haven't got the opportunity to make any and make any work so if you don't make work you can't move through this sort of system i mean in the old days um you know if you did a really award-winning ad piece of advertising you could move to another agency and double your salary but that just doesn't occur anymore i think they're almost disposable of these youngsters actually And then the agency pitch to the client and then the awards. And the photographer side of it, the agents showing the portfolios to the people who give the work out. The shoots where you're completely surrounded by a bunch of people talking about the wrong stuff. Food shoots where you need that many people to choose the perfect pea. And the crowd behind you when you're actually shooting. And this might look like I've made it up, but believe me, this is what happens. Um, in fact, that's not quite enough people for what actually happens. Because everybody, because shoots are rare these days, everybody wants to be on those shoots. And so everybody from the agency comes. So that ended up as an exhibition. And obviously a book. Um, so there's a drastic change to this. In 2017, uh, my father died. Um, and uh, I'd previously been with him to see my mother when she died, I think 10 years previous. Uh, and what was interesting to see, I saw her in the funeral home and thought it was a really unusual thing to witness, probably the first time I'd ever witnessed 
dead buddy in the funeral home. And um, so when he died, I sort of considered whether I should go and take a picture of him in the uh, in the funeral home. So I asked them about it. And they said that many people went in to do this, actually, and she was a bit surprised about. So I asked, the, I asked the family and so they're what they all thought. And they thought, well, you will only have one opportunity to do this. So I went, um, he lived in Lancaster in the north of England. So I went up on the train for, with a 5.4 camera, some negative film. And they had left him in the room for me to photograph. So this is him in the funeral home. I only did five pictures. So this is almost a staged picture, but not by me. I'm just recording what I was witnessing when I went to the funeral home that day. You know, I say there's nothing stranger than reality, and that certainly isn't. It's very, it certainly is like real, and it's very strange. Uh, and obviously, it's a tiny room, so I'm really up against the door there with a the camera. Um, but you know, a lot of people thought these pictures were were staged, actually. But in fact, I just turned up and recorded what was in that room that day. Uh, I sat on these pictures for three years and actually thought about whether to do anything with them. And then eventually did do an exhibition. He was called Jeffrey Valentine because he was born on Valentine's Day. So an exhibition with those five pictures. Which now leads on to the next project, um, which is called Featherstone Street. So we're pretty much up against the pandemic now. So I think Jeffrey Valentine, this, this started on the 14th of February. 2020 and obviously within a month we were in complete lockdown and obviously not the best set of pictures to have in an exhibition around that time plus the fact everything closed anyway so it really didn't get um, much of a, a show really it only lasted for a month that show um, but across from the studio where I work there was a building which is four stories and it was it had actually been demolished and all of a sudden I noticed there was a lot of daylight in the particular space in the, in the floor of the studio. So I started doing some portraits in daylight, very simple portraits, which became this project, Featherstone Street. So these are all shot on 10 by 8 in daylight. And these people are all people who I've worked with or have helped me in my career over the last 35, 40 years. So I just, the work would get in during lockdown, stuff like that. We, people were happy to come in, get a day out, walk into the studio. Would only take maybe three or four sheets of film. They would just sort of sit there and I would um, just record their, their portrait. So these are almost the most stripped back pictures I've ever taken, I suppose, if you want to call it that. I mean, I've, you know, there's no lighting as such, it's all daylight. Um, all I am doing is trying to put a little hint of what they are. And these two guys are set builders have worked with me for years building sets. A photographer called Brian Griffin, who um, always been a little bit of an influence around and who's I often see around at events. An art director I've worked with since college days. It's my agent and three of her people who work with the two designers who've done most of my books. A home economist, stylist who's worked with us over the years. And hair and makeup artists. So I took the decision to do everything on a, either white, black or grey. Um, keep it as stripped out as possible. And really these are a bit like um, the old Penn Avedon approach, We're using a daylight where they had daylight studios and um, pretty much looked at the poses as well from those days and tried to work out who would work well posed in a particular way. This is a stylist, two stylists that I use. This is a guy who prints all my work at Genesis Imaging. 
this as uh, my very first photographic assistant, who is now the photographer. My guy who does all the web, web stuff for us. And the woman who does all the casting. There was 25 in that series. And then that ended up as a little book and an exhibition. And that's the, this was only just before Christmas when we had this exhibition. And the red rectangle on the floor is where all the pictures were taken. So on the left of this picture, there is two huge windows where the daylight came in. Everybody was posed within that red rectangle. Um, and either a black or a white black, black or a gray background was dropped behind or the white wall was used as the background. And that pretty much takes us up to date, actually. So it's a sort of bit of a troll through where it's ended up, but um, not sure how much about documentary portraiture that is, but it's certainly a sort of document of sort of periods of my life where uh, I've changed through the one project to another and has led to another thing. And obviously, almost gone back to the beginning actually because these are the most simple pictures out of the portraits that I've ever done uh, which are not dissimilar to the still lives at the beginning. Well there you go. I'll stop that share. Lovely. Thank you David for, for an excellent okay. sort of resume really sort of of your career taking us right up to date. So I'd yep. like to hand up over to Steve to field some questions from the, the comments. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's a couple of comments and, and Sashi has one, which I, I fully understand. He says the poignancy and the strangeness about most of the photographs, which is, it comes across quite well. It seems quite a circular, circular pathway you've come, as you said yourself, you went from basic still lifes and I've seen, obviously, you know, I know Struan Wallace and, and then I remember watching all his stuff when he started off doing that and then you build back up to those portraits in the Featherstone Street, which are stunning portraits, that's a stunning book. <clears throat> all the work that goes into all that stuff, all the background stuff are done with the people that, that make all these photographs. I mean, as amateurs, we just think it's a glam life, but it's, it's obviously not that glam, is it? There's a lot of hard work goes in behind this stuff. Yeah, well, there is. I mean, it is it's not working is it really <laughs> um but it's um i suppose you're just exploring with other people in your team as well because the team becomes quite important like the casting because what happens is over a period of time is you all develop a very familiar path and you all know you know you almost all agree with each other so everybody starts to sort of contribute in that way um and obviously they know my work so they know what you're looking for as well but um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's also gone through the way my path's gone through how advertising's worked. If you think about it as well, because if you think about how people used to watch the commercials between the mm. programs, because they were better than the programs, and then the adverts were quite good in the old, you know, in the nineties <laughs> and even yeah, further yeah. back, they were quite entertaining. We don't perhaps still thought things were selling as rubbish at the time, but they were sort of fairly entertaining compared to today when, when it became like a globalized sort of world where everything became a color, you know, everything's orange, blue, red, and where everybody looks the same and all the characters have been removed, then that's the result where we are now, isn't it? And that's what I was trying to get at in a way with that paid content project, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the advertising agencies have become like that. They are might as well be banks really, because they're not creative in any shape or form. And it's interesting to see after the pandemic, actually what is gonna happen? Because they, I can't believe they're sustained, they can sustain what they have sustained in the past really. Um, because they, they make money off making work, but nobody's really making any work apart from digital. And digital is just another word for no money, really. So, mm -hmm. so you know, unless you're making big TV commercials or billboard campaigns or press campaigns of which there's no magazines, where's the money going to come from? So I don't know if the whole model will change after the pandemic. It might have accelerated the whole process, I think. Maybe for the better, actually because it was certainly going in a bad direction anyway. Well, that, that certainly is true in a lot of lives. And, and it's exactly, one of the questions, yeah. 
Uh, John, one of the viewers, has said, you know, what about the future? How do you see the future going for yourself and for for the work of photography? Do you see it getting better? Do you see it going backwards? Do you, I mean, you're using 10 by 8 and big negatives, so you're, you've yeah. not using the digital stuff at all. That's well, obviously deliberate. Yeah, well, the jobs are all digital because obviously they're insisting on seeing stuff, so they, you can't get away with all the projects. I've, I've stuck with film because it yeah. sort of wor it works for me, and I can't really break it. Almost, I can't bring myself not to do it, and it's been sort of successful in a way as well. So why would you want to change it? But obviously, when you've got a bunch of people there, they want to see it. You can't get away with doing film. Um, but equally, that there's a sort of positive to that as well, because I think what shooting digital with people helps is you can shoot in film. You could only shoot, like I say, I only shot three three sheets on those last set of Featherstone Street projects. But on a digital camera, you just keep shooting and you choose the best one, so you have a wider range of expression. So you're almost fine tuning the expression on a digital, whereas you have to accept what you've got on three sheets. The, the strange thing about it is it doesn't seem to make it any worse, which is a bit odd, isn't it? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I can shoot on a job, I can shoot 300 frames and it takes us a day to find the one we all like and agree on it. And I've shot three and it, it still doesn't seem any better. It's very odd that I find mm -hmm. it's almost you, you accepting what you've got is part of the process in a way. Do we need more mm -hmm. all the time? That, that slight sort of British cynicism does come out in your work, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so going on that Britishness thing, you said you did quite a lot of foreign uh, advertising stuff in the past because yeah. they wanted that Britishness. Yeah. Do you, do you get more, Dave has asked, do you get more leeway from the foreign advertisers than you do from British advertisers? Do they give you more free reign to do things like that? Yeah, well, I mean, the French, the French were always really great, I thought, because they, they'd come with something and they'd talk about the spirit of it. And they didn't really care as long as it had the spirit of br this British sense of humour. So, um, and they seemed really loose with it. And I think some of those pictures were for France, actually. And they, yeah. they always seemed to produce good work, you know, like the French Railways one with the guy yeah. in it. Yeah. And the two yeah. in the bed, that was for France. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a sort of interesting thing there where, but that doesn't happen anymore because there's none of that cross country work almost because that brand now would be global and it would have to be that boring person who fit all those descriptions in all those countries. Hence the rotten apple in the corner of the wee boy's bed. Yeah, well, yeah. And also if you think about yeah. the phone networks, how, you know, how everybody yeah. looks like they're having a fantastic time and, they're all the same and it can be any country, can't it? So that's killed a little bit of the um, entertainment side of advertising, I think. And it, actually also, we don't believe it, do we? I mean, nobody believes any of it, do they? So no, clearly- no, the, camera, the camera used to never lie, but now the camera doesn't tell the truth anymore than anything else, does it? Yeah. And on the technical side, so you're obviously shooting mainly 10 by 8 stuff. To get that look of the, of the kind of the, the separation, do you, do you use a particular lens all the time or do you chop and change or? Sorry, did, do I use what? Sorry, I missed that. These are particular lanes for most of the work. Is it one, one uh, lens, one well, camera? Well, actually, on that Featherstone suit one, I use the same lens on everything. Right. I decided I would <laughs> strip it back to the no decisions almost. So it was all shot on a on the 1080 is a 360 lens. So that's just slightly longer than a standard lens. Mm -hmm. um, on all, on some of the other stuff, it would depend really on the location or what you were after, possibly. But I tend not to go very much, very wide on lenses. I tend not to be... Um, Slight, small telephoto type things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, standard yeah. or, yeah, or just a little bit longer. Yeah, on the 10.8, that is. And the Featherstone ones, Featherstone Street ones in particular, all the natural lighting you mentioned, if there are people like that. And is there other photographers who you, you strongly admire? And you, you said you look back on all the old stuff and try yeah. to recapture some of that kind of feel. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, everybody looks back at those Avden and Penn portraits, which yeah. are mainly black and white, actually. And yeah. um, But there was always something of that. I mean, we all still look at them now and wonder what it is about them. And um, I think a lot of them are daylight. And uh, 
they're all posed very formally because they were all shooting on large format cameras because you mm -hmm. can't really do much more than pose people. So, and that's where that set came from really. I followed that set of rules, but it wasn't anything that wasn't alien to me anyway. You know, that's what I've been doing through the still life, if, if you like, just yeah. the camera's set up almost like a painting, isn't it? Like an easel with a canvas. And then you form the picture within that frame. And then you capture it. Yeah. And then going forward, a couple of questions about, again, the kind of more artistic process going forward. So you, when, you're, when you're trying to get them published, or you're trying to form an exhibition, your sequencing and your contacts, how do you go about, I mean, your work went personal work, advertising work, yeah. personal work. Is that just luck or is it, is it, do you have a particular plan or? No, I think whatever you put out in the portfolio commercially, you get back. Yeah. So if you show one thing, it sometimes takes a while, but it's usually you get that sort of work back. Um, and then that feeds back in again. I've always found it fed back in again because, you know, you, you tire of doing that sort of work and that forces you to do something new again. Um, and the publishing thing, it's always more or less been self-publishing. I've got a couple of mates who are designers and they have a little publishing thing and I work with them all the time. So yeah. they're sort of vanity. The books are vanity projects. There's no, there's no money to be made in selling photographic books. You just do it to almost, like I say, put a full stop down may put mm. a marker down so as you've got something to allow almost to allow yourself to move on and then you know I sort of always funded my projects from working again so it's almost like without the work I can't do the projects and I suppose that allows me doing the work allows me to shoot on film allows me to shoot on the 10-8 film because I can hopefully get work from it I mean the paid yeah. content one is interesting <laughs> because I thought that would kill my advertising career yeah, yeah. It's basically, but they yeah. didn't really notice. <laughs> they don't think it. I don't think they even think it's them. Okay, because that was that was fairly acerbic. A lot of that, but they didn't. It just was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not me. It's not me. That. Yeah, I'm not like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like all the kids being we're all individuals, but we've all got the same caps and the same jumper. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 We're all blind, I suppose. Aren't we? We're all blind. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> And then the exhibitions, so when you in the, in the books, you seem to like projects, and is that kind of how you've worked your like project? And then you see the book publishes, and the exhibition finishes it, and then you move on to the next one. Is that is that a nice, clean, tidy way to work? I yeah, I think so. Way? Yeah, no, I think that allows you to move on, and not, and often the the last picture in one project is the first picture in the next in one. The next one. So yeah. yeah, it's almost like it's something. Because the project's not so much in Featherstone Street because it is pretty much a set of standard portraits, but in a lot of the other ones, it has moved through a different... I've almost experimented through the project and then that's led to the next thing. Yeah. Especially on Fogies, where it started very graphic and coloured background and led on to being outdoor, like the two guys with the hippie, you know, hitchhikers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the first time I've done lots of propping and lots of dressing on two old guys to make them look like hitchhikers and that became a new you know that led on to a new set of work um but sometimes you just try to jump about as far away from the one you've done which i sort of obviously did that from paid content to the jeffrey valentine father yeah. one really because it couldn't yeah. be further away from the, and that's you know and then perhaps you come back and bridge that gap in between it's sort of like one long line with lots of gaps in it um and at the end of the day you're really just satisfying yourself i think and um that's what keeps you going. <laughs> so here's a, it's a slightly cheeky question. So somebody said, you're a good talker, David. Do you, uh, do you, write, do you write as well? Do you, have you got a book, a written book rather than a photography book, like that, or articles in magazines or? No, no I'm hopeless, hopeless at that really. I mean, I can't, yeah. I can't do any of this without showing the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, some people are visual and some people are more literal. Yeah, yeah. I don't I suppose there's not that many people are good at both. So uh, no, no. Be, that was, it's a good question. That somebody obviously quite enjoyed your talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was one other session. Was one to ask something else. Oh, half question. Would I would. What made you type a sequence of twenty five portraits for your crew, Featherstone Street? So I'm guessing that's the place the building was, or was it? It was actually, and uh, funnily yeah. enough. The building went down, but basically I could see the sky out the windows. Yeah. 
and then it started to go back up again. And so the light started to disappear and then the winter came again and it yeah. went dark again. So I only, it was done within a year that or over, you know, one every couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, I have got a list of about 50 people, but I never made it through. And I am thinking I will carry on, but in a different way, yeah. maybe go completely artificial with it actually. Okay. Just again, as a reaction to that. And also I, I got to 25 and I felt, I was starting to repeat myself a bit, so I thought that was a good point to cut it off. Yeah. Most of the stuff was colour or muted colour. Have you done much in black and white in the past? Or is that um, something you see in the future? Or No, no? I mean, I do, I do the odd, I've done the odd thing, but not really. It doesn't, no, it doesn't really. I've, uh, it's always been colour for me. I've, I've, for some reason, it's never been black and white. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good. I think we've exhausted all the, oh, maybe one more question. Oh, somebody just saying thank you and enjoyed it. That's all it was. <clears throat> I think we've, in, we've exhausted the questions. I'll pass back to James or David if they're here as well. Lovely. So thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Steve. So um, once again, I want to take this time to, to thank you for an excellent talk. Um, inspiring for any photographer, but also inspiring for people that are looking at professional photography, so the way that you have achieved your work where you've got to where you are, um, not that people should copy it, but they can, they can look at and, and see that there, there are different ways of, of achieving things. Um, and then giving the, the view at the end of all the people behind the work. So your latest work, I'll show you, actually these are the people behind and, and your nod of the non-creative people that might be at the forefront coming up with strange ideas. Um, but not the actual workers. So that's brilliant. So thank you on behalf of sort of RPS Scotland. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And I'll bring the meeting to end, but 